Vilya Perez, Amanda, I hope I didn't butcher that too badly, who is Program Associate with the Public Policy Center at University of Arkansas Cooperative Extension System, and she's going to tell us about a really interesting way that they have dealt with some of the issues around water quality and looking at some ways to get public engagement to, to work on these tough issues. So with that, Amanda, thank you very much for joining us, and I will turn the mic over to you. All right. Well, good afternoon. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Raise a hand or agree. All right. It sounds like I'm coming through pretty well. Um, so thank you for listening in this afternoon. Um, just to give you kind of an overview of me and my background, um, I come from the field of behavioral science and I'm actually not a natural resources um, person. Um, I have always been interested in sustainability um, and environmental issues, um, have kept pretty um, well up on the issues related to the public policy process related to those topics and um, but coming to this um, this work I came to extension um, I work at the cooperative extension um, in Arkansas I come I came to this work about two years ago um, to work on a grant through funding from our Arkansas Natural Resources Commission and I was hired to do stakeholder engagement around a public issue um, with it being water quality. And so we've gone around the state, we've engaged a host of stakeholders to try to get them involved in the discussion of addressing water quality at the local level within watersheds around the state. And it's actually turned out really successful and um, we had a lot of local participation and I'll, I'll kind of go into the details of that as we move through. But one of the interesting things about doing this is um, as part of my training in behavioral science in the field of public health, um, I was able to learn about liberating structures, which is a phenomenal tool for getting people um, to get to, as best as you can describe it, consensus on um, some controversial issues. And for those of you um, who work in natural resource conservation, it looks like many of you do, you know that sometimes it's hard to get consensus um, across different political positions or um, different perspectives on industry or business or environmental issues, all of those things. And so um, this is a tool that we use that we were able to get to some consensus. So let's get right into it. All right. So I'm going to talk to you today um, about um, who we are with the Public Policy Center and what we do, and then provide an overview of what we did with that grant and with those public forums. And then I'm going to talk about what is liberating structures and how we used it, and then discuss the utility of that within um, other areas of work. So the Public Policy Center um, is a center that was created about 10 years ago um, for the Cooperative Extension to work on public issues education and we work on a range of things um, and really our goal is to respond to the needs of the state regarding the issues that are critical and it often relates to the policy, the environmental um, and the systems development work that's needed and we really focus on increasing knowledge and awareness, um, engaging in public participation and trying to get stakeholders to the table to talk about those controversial issues and then helping um, those stakeholders work to implement alternatives to whatever issue they're working on. And so currently the Public Policy Center in Arkansas um, is working on a few different public issues. Our main one is water quality and has been for most of the time that we've been in existence. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been working on an air quality grant um, where one of my colleagues is um, really synthesizing the literature on um, agricultural burning. And then my primary area of interest is on food systems develop, and that's where it ties into the overarching kind of community development work. We also do ballot issue education and then other requests that come in as needed. And so the Public Policy Center is actually situated within the Arkansas Cooperative Extension Service under our Community and Economic Development Department. And so for water quality, um, we have been charged um, for the last, 
four grant cycles, which is two year terms, so almost eight years, with working on addressing um, non point source pollution education and management planning for the state. And so we've worked with, as I said, the Arkansas Natural Resources Commission, which is our state agency that manages the non point source pollution management plan for the state. And we've been contracted with them through grants to help them to prepare that management plan to do the stakeholder engagement across the state to get people involved in advising on the plan um, to informing on what the regulations are to including what the priorities for water quality are related to non-point source pollution. And it looks like most people are working in water quality work, so you're probably familiar with that. But if you're not, non-point source pollution is really um, the water pollution that occurs from sources that we cannot point to. And so that can be a, from a host of different um, potential sources. They can include agriculture, um, they can include urban systems, um, they can include um, a number of things, which I can, I'll get to more in a moment. But through the non-point source management planning process and our work with the Arkansas Natural Resources Commission, uh, the Cooperative Extension has worked to set a set of priorities for the state to focus our efforts. And so as most states throughout the country, there is limited funding coming from the Environmental Protection Agency to do this work. And so the funds have to be spread around. And so our state went through a planning process to determine how to set priority for distributing those funds. And based on a set of criteria that, that they've worked on, they've decided that given the water quality issues and some of the other issues to set a priority to focus on the 10 watersheds that are highlighted in the map that you see here. And so as part of the grant, we decided to go to those watersheds and conduct stakeholder engagement forums within each of those priority watersheds to try to encourage them to get to a state of working on non-point source pollution management planning and to actually write a watershed management plan. And so for those of you that are not that familiar, um, this is with, with non-point source pollution or, or water quality overall. This is just a diagram that we use for public education. Um, it's a watershed model. And as you can see here, there are several um, areas of what would be the topography of a community. And so there's a farm over to the right and there's a water treatment plant in the middle and then a suburban neighborhood with construction over to the left and there's a golf course. And then in the top middle, you can see a couple of trees there and what looks like some brown area, and that's a f representing forestry. But when it rains, it drains, and all of the um, disturbance that we do to the land, all of the things that we apply to the land, whether it's chemicals or fertilizers or um, if we're um, moving dirt to build new homes, all of those things um, can run off down the streets or across the fields and into our streams and lakes and can affect water pollution. And so that's just the basic overview. So, so we decided um, as part of the grant to do water quality stakeholder engagement forums. And as I said, we did 10 of those throughout the states and those watersheds that we had highlighted in the map. And we just really went around um, after we had done a pretty extensive communication strategy to reach out to get people to attend. And that's one of the issues that a lot of folks who do this work, it's, it can be kind of a complicated area for the general public to, to be interested in or understand. Uh, so we worked with the press to write press releases. We worked with our county agents throughout all of the counties that were involved to reach out to their listservs to engage people to attend. We sent out invitations to chambers, to Farm Bureau, um, to just a long list of groups that, that we could engage to get attendance at these meetings. And we were really targeting just a broad base of stakeholders, um, a number of people who live, work, play, all of those things in those communities. And our target was really to have people come out to get to sit down and talk with one another to discuss what some of their challenges are and what some of their concerns were. 
And so I'll talk more about really what the impacts were of those meetings a little bit later. But um, on this slide, we have um, kind of a, a cartoon graphic represent representation of what water pollution is. And, and for some of the participants, this can be complicated information and um, and we so we do an overview of an education for why we're there what we're talking about and all of those and we share these with the folks that attend and they can take those home and educate their their children and things like that and we also did other public education meetings at our flower and garden show or um, at school events or things like that around the state as well and so in addition to having these forums in our educational um, events, um, as part of those forums, we use a structure known as liberating structures to try to open up the conversation. And so we would host these meetings and these structures are really intended to break the norm of conversation in a public forum. And so oftentimes when you have a controversial topic that you're presenting to the public, um, a lot of people will come and do a presentation and ask for input and then a vocal minority will participate and say, these are the one or two things that we see as the big issue. And oftentimes that really isn't the consensus of the group. And so by using liberating structures, it offers an opportunity for you to really engage with the public and to get an open dialogue for all participants. And so liberating structures helps you achieve more than what you wouldn't using the conventional methods. And it helps transform how we think, how we plan and how we make decisions. And that how we make decisions is probably the most critical use that, that I've seen um, it work in. And it, it's really about sharing knowledge. Oftentimes, if, even if that is, um, if there are different perceptions and different um, values that are represented among the attendees that, that come to those meetings, Liberating Structures offers a way for you to get to consensus on those issues. And so it offers an opportunity for really kind of a collective intelligence. And so it also takes the pressure off of the person facilitating those meetings to not necessarily have to be the expert on any given topic or to really have to structure all of the details of those meetings because when you use these structures it allows an opportunity for it to really be an open dialogue from the participants. And so here is the the text um, that the authors um, who have created this overall kind of tool for facilitating meetings um, I think they're in their second or third version of this, uh, and there is a link provided there if you're interested in looking looking at that. But not only um, is can you find out information about the overall kind of idea of what Liberating Structures is at that website, but they actually give you access to all of those tools. So it's kind of a shareware, it's free access to that information. You can go on, you can read about the structures, you can use them. Um, and you don't necessarily have to buy the book. Um, I have decided to purchase the book so that I can use that um, in planning and facilitating. And it's sometimes easier to just grab that or to take that with me rather than um, referring to the website. But the authors um, really put this system of facilitating meetings together because they realize that people in a range of issues, and they've worked on... Um, conflict in South Africa, they've worked on um, issues with energy and conservation, just a range of issues and they've, they've been able to really see progress. And so it's just another tool to put in your toolkit um, um, if you work in extension or other areas where you're conducting facilitation and it really is a way to accommodate any size group. So oftentimes it's really difficult to open a discussion when you have a large number of attendees. So if, you, if you're trying to have, um, to gain information from a large group, oftentimes that can be an issue if you have 50 to 100 participants. Um, sometimes you don't have enough time to do that, but there are ways that you can do that using these structures. It also offers an opportunity for you to let go of the control of the meeting. And so um, as today, I'm, you know, 
giving the con conventional kind of lecture style of what this is, but oftentimes um, liberating structures opens up an opportunity so that everyone can really equally contribute, it can lead to progress rapidly, and it really um, engages individuals and they want to participate and they often leave meetings feeling like their voices were heard. And so that can lead to really um, great results. And so there are a number of liberating structures. Um, as you can see on the screen here, um, there are several. And if you go to the website, you can read more about how to do each of these. It gives you a detailed kind of overview of what they are, um, when it's appropriate to use them, when it's not, if you need certain kinds of materials or not. And then I've used several of them. I've used Wicked Questions. Um, I've used the Nine Whys. I've also used Celebrity Interviews. Um, and for the water quality forums, we actually use the one, two, four, all, which is what I'll talk to you about um, more as we go further along in, in the presentation. And so for the water quality forums, when you look at kind of our forum overview, like if I were to send you an agenda, um, it would kind of be just the basics. But the heart of it is what discussion comes out when you implement the liberating structures. And so we structured our forums with a basic introduction. We offered a networking opportunity. Um, we delivered an education program on non-point source pollution um, for those who attended that weren't familiar with that. And then we had engagement with the attendees about, you know, what are the water uses and land uses in the areas just to get people to kind of start thinking about about their watershed and then what are the water quality concerns. So that was the critical issue that we wanted answered when we came there. But if we had opened the forum and just said, you know, we're here, we want to learn about this. And I've attended many public meetings where this has happened. Um, oftentimes when you go to meetings and there's a review of regulations, um, this is how it's facilitated. It's here's, here's an overview of what we're proposing for the regulations. Does anyone have any questions or concerns about what we're proposing? And then one or two people will speak up and no one really gets to the depth of, of what they're wanting to get into. And so using these structures can really break, help you break outside of that kind of just limited thinking and um, dominance by one or two vocal minorities. Um, but we also wanted to know what should be prioritized related to water quality. And so um, we used a, a technique that many of you are probably familiar with, the nominal group where people vote um, with dot stickers and all of that. Um, but we used a, we structured the meeting overall so that we were able to lead them into discussing what their concerns were after they had had an opportunity to get to meet and greet people who were there after they spoke about their community and described it in a certain way. Um, and then we got to the critical questions. We also asked them about their values, and I'll explain why we did that in a moment. Um, and then we asked them who else to engage. And so the forum structure, um, as I explained earlier, um, we put out a pretty extensive communications plan to get um, folks to attend. And as part of that, um, we we took out newspaper ads to advertise the meetings. We posted on social media. And then the forums um, were about three hours. And oftentimes people think that that's a really long meeting to ask a group of stakeholders what they see as the number one or two priority for water quality. But if you don't structure it in a way that you offer time for people to network and engage and, and kind of be led along into getting to that, people oftentimes feel like their, their ideas or their concerns weren't heard. We offered it um, in, in different times of day, but the most popular time um, that we received feedback from our Cooperative Extension County agents was hosting them in the evenings from five to eight. Um, we also provided handouts, um, materials regarding education on non-point source pollution. We offered kind of a discussion and there was some group work done. And so our goal was really to kind of build up kind of their anticipation of wanting to talk about water quality. Um, we gave them a break so that they could have time to network. And then we 
plan to kind of wind down into getting to the details of what are the concerns and what are the priorities and what to do next. And so liberating structures is about not being the expert. And so oftentimes, you know, just as we're doing today, you listen to someone talking about a given topic area and you're able to absorb a portion of that information and you'll take back one or two lessons that may or may not be applicable to what you're planning to do next. But liberating structures really puts things in a format so that um, the person who's providing the information is not the expert. It's the group that's being engaged at the time. And so with our introductions, we didn't just ask people to talk about, hi, I'm, you know, Amanda from Cooperative Extension in Arkansas. We asked them um, to share that information, but also talk about what, are the, what were the driving forces, what were the critical factors that brought them to the meeting today. And so that's how we opened it. And so that was our icebreaker. So people, you know, we would have farmers come in and say, I'm just really worried that there are going to be some more regulations and, and I want to know what this is all about. Or we'd have conservationists come in and talk about how, you know, the value of the water to them or the environmental sustainability and how critical that is to our future. And it really like opened the stage for people to kind of get to the heart of what they were there for. And people really responded well to that. And then, as I said, um, we offered an opportunity for networking. And so when they came in, um, we handed them a folder with information. And in, in that folder, we had this, um, what we called the Water Quality Connection Sheet. And as people were going around the room, introducing themselves, talking about what that driving force was that brought them to the meeting, we asked them to write down their names and write down their interest. And then during our networking break, to go and talk with someone. But not just talk with someone that shared a similar interest, but actually take the time to go talk to someone who had a different perspective than they did. Because, you know, I shared with the group that oftentimes when we talk to people who have the same ideas, we often don't get to a place of better understanding about how to solve problems. And to really solve the problems, it's best when you talk to someone who has a different set of perspectives as you. And that seemed to work really well and we had a lot of engagement during our networking breaks. And so of course I said we did the education program and um, my colleague Kristen Higgins um, provided a PowerPoint presentation and went over um, watershed education and what water quality pollution was and defined what non-point source pollution is and all of the different types of non-point source pollution and what the potential sources from those types of pollution were. And we went into describing um, all of that, um, with that being nutrients and sediment, um, fecal bacteria, toxic and hazardous substances, and then how um, trash is not necessarily a non-point source pollution, but um, leaching from that trash could be a non-point source pollution. So we provided a pretty extensive um, education program, and I'm not going into the details of what that included here, um, and I'd be happy to kind of share all of our slides if, if anyone's interested in that uh, or interested in doing a similar program. But um, So we provided that for the folks that may not have understood the depth of um, what water quality was and what water pollution was. And then we moved into an open discussion, and this is where we had um, kind of a traditional, like, asking the audience to share what their thoughts were on um, how water was used and how land was used. And so people talked about, you know, in this watershed, we have a pristine river that we really um, like to canoe, you know, kayak, fish, all of those things. And then in other watersheds, drinking water was a major um, issue that they were trying to address. Um, some, but not many, um, have had transportation and that's how the water was used. And then of course, in our state, agriculture is, is a um, pretty signif significant economic driver for our state. So water use within agriculture um, is pretty significant here. And so we just kind of opened a dialogue, started talking, um, people described their watershed, and, and we were able to learn about kind of the ins and outs of, of the watershed. But then we moved into the critical piece of the meeting, and that was using deliberating structures to talk about water quality concerns. 
And so the liberating structures that we used was the one, two, four, all. And um, this is probably one of the most popular ones that people use when conducting um, any kind of forum that is trying to get to um, consensus from a, a small group or a large group. And our groups were typically between 20 and 40 participants. Um, there was one watershed, we had 50 participants. There was representation from a broad base of um, different, um, whether it was, we did have a lot of agency representation from forestry and natural resources and conservation districts and all of that. But we had a number of farmers, landowners, business owners um, participate as well. And so with this liberating structure, what you do is have individuals um, sit down and you provide uh, a piece of paper where they write down what brought them to the meeting. And so we, we just ask them, you know, what, what are the major concerns about water quality in this watershed for you? And of course, this is asked after they've been provided the education. And then um, the next step was for two minutes to discuss their concerns with a partner. And so this is where they begin to have that dialogue and networking. And then they move into small groups and, and do that for about four minutes. And then the groups are asked to either come to consensus on one issue or to share all of the concerns that were presented. And they could decide what to do with that. And so that was getting to priority selection. And so the group shared their information, you know, after brainstorming, if they could reduce to one or two issues, they did that. If they couldn't get to consensus, they shared all of that. And so then we were narrow, narrowing those priorities. And so after we had all of the concerns represented, we used a kind of nominal group where people go around and pick what their highest priorities were and um, vote with, you know, the dots, the stickers. And for the ones that they did not get to really close consensus on, we went through the process a second time, but I believe we only had to do, do that with one of the ten. But it was pretty clear what the priorities were. And so sediment was the number one driver for water quality concerns within our state um, in these ten priority watersheds. And even in some of the other areas, if you look at the topic areas that were represented, it tied pretty closely to erosion and even the urban development um, was related to sediment loss, oftentimes in the construction of new communities and what some of the impacts were from that. And so these were the top water quality concerns um, presented. But with the groups talking about those concerns, because oftentimes people get kind of overwhelmed by what are we going to do? How are we going to address these issues? This is a huge burden. We don't have the resources to do this. And it, sometimes when you talk about this kind of work, people get really overwhelmed with what to do next. And so after they identified their concerns, I asked them to go through another liberating structures exercise that I've created, and that is um, what I call standing up for, and you can put the last term in for whatever you're working on. And so I, for this, we had them stand up for their values. And so I asked everyone in the room very quickly to go around the room and to stand up and share one value for addressing the concerns that were just presented, why it was important to them. And these were the words that were shared over all of the 10 priority watersheds. And people were able to see that their differences, that they had more similarities than differences by going through this exercise. And so we had a break um, and I asked them to talk to someone who shared those different values. And we saw farmers and conservationists talking. We saw business owners and agencies talking. And by the end of the meeting, they were really networking and there was a lot of opportunity um, for next step planning. And so once the concerns were identified, we had them go through an exercise of identifying a number of stakeholders who also needed to be engaged who were not at those meetings. And, and um, we went through that exercise by each of the different um, types of stakeholders that should be engaged. And those could have included people from all of the different kind of areas that are represented here. Um, but we had them to really hone in on what their water quality concern was and then who should those stakeholders be. And so 
After their concerns were identified, the stakeholder engagement list was created. We talked to them about the next steps for planning. And so um, one of the ways that I like to talk about this kind of work when you're talking about systems change and water quality work is systems change is that we can't think about it as this like overwhelming big thing that we're never going to achieve. And I, I talked to him about putting it into kind of a, a honey do list or a home to do list. And that is we're just going to focus on what we can and knock off one thing at a time and get to where we need to get to. And after you knock off several things, you're going to be addressing the larger issues that you're trying to work on and eventually getting to systems change. Um, I suggested that they partner with non-traditional partners and then at the end of the meetings we summarized the notes and we shared those um, and gave them some suggested steps for action um, and suggested that they move to action. And so what were the outcomes of these meetings? And so we had 219 participants at the 10 water quality forums um, including um, um, 38 county agents, so that's in addition to the 219, we had 38 county agents attend. Almost 60% of those lived in the watershed and then 80% worked in the watershed. And these were the groups that were represented. And so, we, as I said, we had conservation districts, we had timber managers because forestry and um, paper industry is huge in Arkansas. We had landowners, people who described themselves as just residents, lots of agency representation, producers, uh, meaning agricultural producers, and representation from municipalities and active watershed groups. And so what did we learn um, when we conducted our evaluation? And these were just some of the things that the attendees said. Um, and so our evaluation feedback was was really helpful because after facilitating these meetings, a lot of times people feel like they're not well represented or they didn't get their issues um, brought to the table or it's not that informative to them. But our evaluation showed that people were really felt engaged and evolved and informed. And so these are just some of the, the things that were shared. And so um, as one person said, they got a crash course and the issues that were facing the watershed and the passion and personalities that exist. And, um, and that was from one of our watersheds that is actually moving to the next stage. And so then we got some feedback about what needed to be improved. And, um, and one of those is not having enough landowners. And um, oftentimes that's agricultural or forest landowners. It's really hard to reach that population. Um, we did have several, but um, I would be interested in hearing what others at some point um, that work in this area um, have done to engage landowners. We have a few groups within our state that are actually going farm to farm or door to door um, to, to, to do that work. And so after the forum, um, these are the things that several of our water quality participants um, said that they were planning to do, um, which was really exciting for us because they didn't just come to the forum. By the end of it, they had an issue that they thought was critical to work on. They were ready to move to action. They engaged with the people who were there. They networked and they were in the process of planning before the meetings were over. So we felt that we had really gotten them to a place of taking the next step for action. And so the Liberating Structures tool, um, hosting a webinar is not really the best way to, to educate on how to use this, um, but it's one way for us to get the word out that it's a tool to use. And so um, I was open to the opportunity for sharing it. I prefer to facilitate meetings so that there's a lot more engagement but that's difficult to do when you're in remote locations and um, with the software and technology that we have. But when you use these structures, um, it really creates a space for innovation. Um, and what's critical is for you to, to think about not only how your meeting is structured, but how the space is structured. Everyone needs to be sitting so that they're making eye contact with one another. Um, you need to have um, materials that relate to the kinds of structures that you're using. Um, you need to think about how participation is distributed based on the kinds of attendees that you're going to be having at the meeting. 
you need to think um, about how the groups are configured when they're going to be working on um, these different structures. And then the sequence of steps and how time is allocated for each step. And so it's about all of the little details, all of the little things that get you to get people to open up and share what they really came to share. And so for us, um, one of our biggest outcomes for this so far um, was getting watersheds um, who have not been very active to move through the process of watershed management planning. And we are excited to say that two of those, the Strawberry River and the Cache River, which are in northeast Arkansas, um, are in the process of creating watershed management plans. And then um, the Poto River, which is um, on the far west side of the state, um, in the center there, they, um, they are in the process of planning for that, but they don't quite have the management plan um, ready to go for approval yet. And so um, all of these little steps have really led to a big step, and that is a step to change for addressing water quality. Because these watersheds have to have watershed management plans to be eligible for the funding that's available um, throughout the state um, program. And so I would challenge you, um, to look into liberating structures and to use it um, to host meetings and to facilitate workshops um, to get people to really open up. And so um, it's an opportunity to include and unleash everyone's ideas. Um, it offers an opportunity where people can really provide respect for one another um, because they get to hear their voices, they get to hear everyone's voices and have representation for all. It's an opportunity to build trust because people feel like they're being heard, um, and it's a, and it's fun. It's a lot more fun to have a dialogue with someone than it is to give just a presentation. And so, um, I challenge you to go out and liberate um, through your forums, through the work that you're doing, um, and look into um, this tool for yourself. So this is um, my contact information if you want to have some dialogue about what we did or how we did it and provide more information, um, please email me or call me. Um, and that's us doing a stream cleanup um, outside of the back of our cooperative extension. And so there's some stream bank erosion and some non-point source pollution and that's me in a silly cooperative extension hat um, working and doing stream cleanup um, for our small watershed in the back of our cooperative extension. So I will take questions at this time. Um, if Anyone wants to put those in the chat box? Um, and Rachel, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think since we have a small group, if you have a mic and you want to just ask your question, you're welcome to. You may need to enable it by clicking on the green micro or on the microphones at the top of your screen till it turns green and hit the allow button. Otherwise, feel free to jot a question into the chat box. So I'll, I'll just ask one question while some people are typing there. Um, Amanda, I see that you're using a lot of different approaches, and I appreciate you giving the website because I just pulled it up on my other side over here to be looking at it. And I, I, I can imagine that it's there's not a perfect one of these approaches that works in any one setting, but do you have a favorite? I think the one, two, four, all is my favorite because you are able to get people to first think on their own and they come up with whatever you're asking, whatever question you're answering, you're trying to get answered, but then they have a chance to kind of have a dialogue with a partner and then with a small group. And when they move into small groups, the dynamic changes. They go from having just one idea to it's almost, it's almost like a coffee shop conversation. You know, if you're sitting down with a friend at a coffee shop, sometimes you can, Come up with all kinds of things, you know, whether whatever you're working on or interested in or whatever issue of the day people are discussing, you're able to, using that dialogue, kind of get to new ideas and innovation. And I think for me, it's that you can see it happening in these meetings. Um, um, we actually use the um, celebrity interview um, for our our state conference that we host each year um, for non-point source pollution, which is a very technical conference where we talk about um, 
projects that have been funded and the successes that they've had and the challenges that they've had and um, they just kind of give an overview of the program and so um, the director of the um, state program oftentimes um, people because of his personality oftentimes don't really ask questions because he's he kind of knows the ins and outs of everything and so they don't really ask questions of him and so we changed the dynamic so instead of him being like the celebrity or the leader um, we had kind of a casual conversation almost like a talk show interview and people really opened up and they shared a lot more information and they asked a lot more questions and so you really kind of have to see these things played out to really understand the value of it so um, but those are the two that I've seen that have been pretty effective and so I'm looking at Rebecca's question right now. And so for Rebecca's question, she's saying, are there groups that are more organized than others or those that are really dominating um, table discussions? And so oftentimes I think as the facilitator, it's your role to go around um, if it's not too big of a meeting and try to see what how the conversation is happening um, and if a person is really dominating when you get to some of that um, larger kind of group work um, then you can kind of ask questions about did other people participate did all ideas get represented when it's a small group of two to four most of the time everyone gets a chance to talk if you you know, I've been to workshops where they've had us do things like this, but you have 10 or 12 people at a table. There's going to be a natural leader that emerges. And when you do that, you're not going to get representation from everyone. So if you're trying to get ideas represented by everyone, you really want to put it in a small group setting. Because if you go very big, it's just human nature. Someone's going to take the lead. So if you take a look at the website, um, it really goes kind of into detail about how you should use those structures when it's appropriate, when it's not, how much time you should have, um, um, how many participants in each of those. And so um, I would encourage you to kind of look through those. Um, there are a few YouTube videos if you go on YouTube and just look up liberating structures and you can see how it's been used in other settings. Um, and that, that may be more informative than the talk that I provided to you here today because it's, uh, you have to see these structures in action. You know, it looks like Mary has a question coming in. So this may be a minor question, but I, just as I was looking, there's a pretty significant difference in the color version versus black and white as far as cost. How much do, would you say that the color matters? Oh, for the book? Yeah. Um, let's see. I have it right here. Um, I mean, in general, it's kind of a, a black and white, I would say, book in and of itself. I don't know that the, the color is going to be that important. Because it's mostly text. There's not a whole lot of graphics that are represented um, in the book. So that was kind of interesting. You don't usually see that much difference in cost. but Yeah. The group, I um, actually was trained to do this um, through a communications class that's required through a doctorate program that I've um, been going through. And they... Um, they didn't require that we purchase the book because all of the resources are actually on the website and you could just pull them down from there. Um, I just like to have it in hand because I can flip through um, and look at all of them instead of going back and forth between them. Um, and then Mary was saying that she's never heard of liberating structures before. It may really help with some of our water quality issues. And so um, when it's a controversial topic and you have lots of different opinions, you're able to have people feel like their ideas are represented, even if they don't agree with 
the outcome. And so when people feel like they express themselves, but then the group as a whole decided that they didn't want to work on that issue, people are less defensive. Um, one of the water quality forums that we held most recently, one of the last ones, there's a group that's really concerned about fluoride in the water. And this discussion is happening across the country. People um, are really kind of gearing up and um, talking about how it's a huge pollution issue for, for water quality. Um, but even though there were a couple really vocal individuals who were trying to dominate the meeting and to talk about fluoride, after the forum, they were even open to working on the issue that the group identified because there were so many people in the room that were interested in working on the other issue. And so that almost never happened. <laughs> um, and so, but because people felt like their ideas were heard and they felt respected, they were open to working on what the group wanted to work on. And so, Mary, are there any specific issues that, um, that you're having a challenge with? Yeah, while she's typing, I... I do want to just add this note for y'all that can just jot down and save the date. And I'll put it in the chat box also. But as we mentioned, this is a series. So our next presentation is December 16th at 9 a.m. Central. And this will be Brian Whitaker from Oklahoma State University that will be talking about developing and implementing an effective e-commerce program. And again, I'll add that to the chat here so that you can see it while Mary finishes typing. So that sounds like something that happened with um, when I was first hired, um, our previous director was working on zoning um, for an area of development that was occurring next to our reservoir for our drinking water. And so they were trying to rezone it to, um, to protect development in the area and the property owners were really concerned about, you know, property rights and all of those things. And so that forum was held in a way where we did not use liberating structures for the majority of the meetings. And there was so much controversy. There was arguments, there were name calling, there were all of these things. But when we got to working on addressing these issues using these structures, people were able to get to consensus and make decisions about um, what to do next. And they felt like they were better represented at that point. So I think we are almost out of time. And I, I do see that there are maybe another question or two. And so we'll, we'll watch for those. But also thank you, Amanda, for sharing your contact information in case anybody wants to ask further questions. As I mentioned at the beginning of this, we are recording so that the session will be up so that you can look, look at it again if you'd like to, and the slide set will be there also. So, Amanda, you've done a great job of sharing with us some of the, the ways that you've used this great resource to solve some very complex problems, and, and I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you, Rachel. And I'm happy to answer any questions or follow up afterwards. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us. And again, please mark December 16th on your calendars. Join us again at 9 a.m. for the presentation with Brian Whitaker on developing and implementing effective e-commerce programs. 
and if you scroll back up a little bit on the chat you can see that I've put the link where all of the archives will be so we might want to jot that and put a bookmark and be able to go back and, and look at the other webinar series presentations if you missed any of those so again Amanda thanks a lot appreciate it